Wow, everyone. I know that you fell in love with Shad Meshad last week, a man who definitely is serving his country even after being in the service. So this today will be a tribute to all he has done. So let's see Shad Meshad and the Pink Lady and watch other things that you will be so proud to see him do for our military. Here we go. It was total insanity from suicides to fraggings to racial riots in this war that, you know, we're going to win the hearts and minds. I mean, God, we lost our own hearts and minds trying to do something that wasn't there. And look, what, look where we are now, 20 years pulling out. Did we win the hearts and minds of the Afghan people, the, uh, the Middle Eastern people, wherever we've been? You know, it's, it, it's, it's not what it appears to be. And I have been vocal about that for over 50 years. I mean, it's, it's I, I, when I was reading some of the things, how you started, I mean, you know, as I said, from the, the, the veterans, uh, the cow vet, and then you went and you found these guys and stuff. Keith Knudsen concert started you in a big way. Keith Tell Knudsen uh, was a drummer for the famous Doobie Brothers and now Hall of Fame band. Um, all, all but two are alive today, but uh, uh, the originals. Right. And uh, he had read my book. You know, my ah. book was kind of like... And the name of that book? Captain for Dark Mornings. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. that. That's an interesting story how I got that title. But he had read it, and his wife was working with a producer that wanted to help me get my foundation started. And he was trying to get the Eagles, who had disbanded with bad right. blood. And so Keith's wife was working for him. They were trying to get them together to put my foundation on the map back in 85, 86. They were huge. And they just weren't coming together. And Kate, who is French Lebanese and Scotch Irish, she's like my sister, oh my gorgeous like you, swear to God. And she goes, well, my husband, with the Mississippi accent, was a drummer for, you know, whatever. And I gave him your book, and he wants to meet you. Wow. So I have this meeting with him at, at this producer's right. place, and he goes, listen, I just want to tell you, I burned my draft card. I almost spent three years in a federal prison for doing that, but there was a glitch in my trial. I went on to become a mega millionaire playing with the famous rock band that's all we dispersed four years ago. And I, if, if you're willing to talk to me, I fell in love with this guy. He was a spirit, one of the most spiritual men Ever. I mean, we became very close over time, but almost immediately. And then he decided to send, how many more copies of that book you got? He sent it to all the band members that were alive to say, hey, uh, could I get y'all to meet Shad, which took about six months, and could we come together for one night? And the long story short, because we can't be here all day, is I met them all. They had, none of them had spoken in years with each wow. other, uh, and they decided they would put their swords down, and they would do one night at the Hollywood Bowl, which oh Keith produced, and it was one of the greatest nights of my life. We had 22,000 there, oh. oh. uh, 3,000 disabled vets. We had Pioneer, Ralph's, or whatever. The, the promoters got all that, but I had them there. I had all the paraplegic and quadriplegics from Long Beach bust up. They sat on front row. I had all the playmates from the Playboy Mansion. Not that I was connected, but because I was on TV right, all the right. time, I had them with all the paraplegics that there during the whole concert. Rock the world. They came back and they've been rolling ever since with different members and stuff. But they got inducted last year in the rock and roll. Keith passed away in 05. Oh. And it was pretty devastating. Uh, but, you know, but the mission is the mission. Right, right. It's just like in combat. You lose people or whatever, and you have to get up and contain yourself, which I'm doing today because I look at you and I get, there's so much a shed. I'm probably more of a pink, pink inside in the sense of our energy, and uh, that's never left. And uh, hopefully the body will hold up as I tear through it for another five or ten years, whatever. You said something, and I... Quite, I was like, 
Wow. I mean, everything you've done, I've been wow. But this was, you said something to people. You said, take it to the street. Veterans need concrete, street concrete, help in real time. And you actually, Shad, you slept on the streets. That's where they were. And I was proud. Listen, it was not a burden for me. It was an honor. Because I, uh, I slept in bunkers and stuff in Vietnam with 18, 19-year-old, 20-year-olds primarily. That's where I flew in and out of uh, fire bases and stand-down areas or whatever that year. It was tattooed in me, just like y'all's love and the work you're doing. It's tattooed. It never stops. You don't stop breathing. You don't stop eating. You know, unless you want to die, and it's what fuels me. It fuels me, and and to this day, I mean, I feel like I haven't even started, and it's it's frustrating. But I have to take it day, day, by, by, day, day, day by day by day, right. and you just learn that. Well, the thing that was good and was bad it was all the experience that you went through. I mean, you had to go through in order to then help others, but because of what you went through. They accepted you, oh, yeah. the veterans. So then they, so that opened up. I mean, someone who was not a veteran, who didn't go through it, uh, there would be this wall that they have to overcome. Didn't you didn't happen. Didn't you could happen. go right through it. Yeah, well, I had the scars. They could see that. You, you have that, that look. And when you talk about your experience, or did you serve, or what did you do, right. or whatever, as right. soon as it, they know. I mean, it, you, you know who's lying and listen, I've sat on TV shows with Medal of Honor winners that were flight attendants. Oh, I've got oh, stories you wouldn't oh, believe oh. and I, I didn't know them, but yeah, they were there telling all these, you know, John Wayne stories or Audie Murphy and they weren't even veterans. Even veterans. I mean, I mean 50 wow. years, believe me, <laughs> as you know, we've yes. had experiences. You said once, we fought two wars, the war in Vietnam and the war coming home. That is heavy duty. It's true. It's true. How, how were you treated? Were you treated just like, I mean, that you didn't do anything or that you did things that were immoral? I mean, where did that come from, Shad? It came from society. Society, uh, even today, but society had really uh, bought the bureaucracy in the rap the talk about we're winning the war, we need more troops. You know, you saw it escalated from, right. from advisors to a half a million troops every year towards the last six or seven years of the war. And it was just hype. And America lives on hype. Yeah. People, whether it's social media today or whatever, you can put it out there and lie all you want and there's going to be people that are going to buy it. But they, they didn't understand that we were just like Audie Murphy, they came back with problems or whatever. We fought the good fight. How did we lose the war when we never lost a battle? That's how people, yeah, are you serious? Why, well, well, how did you, what happened? I said, talk to the politicians. Talk right. to, you know, there's still unknown things of why we went in. Look how we went into Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction. Look how many people have died and how many we've killed because it was a lie. I tell my audience this with a hesitancy because I'm not sure about the statistics and you'll know it more than I will. 22 or more veterans every day right die of suicide, the primary cause. I, I mean... It's devastating. We'll be right back. It's about the humans. These humans, those humans, Groovin and Golden. It's about getting more than health insurance and a partner who listens and acts. Humana calls it human care. It's talking to a doctor from your couch or helping you find a cheaper prescription before you ask. It's helping you fix the rugs so you don't fall and keeping you social, online or off. It's getting to know you so you can be your healthiest. That's our superpower. That's human care from Humana. So, Shad, there's so much experience uh, that you've had from the very beginning of doing this with the National Veterans Foundation, uh, with your rap groups and the phone things and all that. What are the major changes that you've found that you instituted to get help 
to these veterans? Well, the, my first national program uh, we'll get to, but we've been talking about my first seven or eight years on yes. the streets here in L.A., and it was during that period that professionals from Dr. Robert Lifton at Yale and Charles Figley at, at uh, Purdue were looking at my work trying to say uh, vets were being classified either as character disorders, which is no benefits, or schizophrenic. That was the two diagnoses. Where you're neither. You're neither. I mean, you can't serve and be schizophrenic. I mean, if you understand it. And a character disorder means you can't obey orders. You can't uh, handle superiors. How do, you yeah, how do you go in the military? You're not going to be in the military. You know, not right. that people haven't acted out. Don't right. get me wrong. But it was just wrong. And so there was a group of people that were really Dr. Heim Shatton uh, in New York, a psychiatrist, a Jewish psychiatrist, that latched onto me and Figley. And they were trying to present every year at the APA. In the first two years that I went with Figley, right. We're in an amphitheater, 500. There'd be three people in there to listen to our argument that we have to come up with a proper diagnosis for trauma. This is trauma. This isn't schizophrenia. This isn't being a, a, a character disorder. So this is the po this is this was our battle. It went on from 75, 76, 77. Figley came out with a book called "Delayed Stress Amongst Vietnam Veterans" because of the push from Cranston to get the field, the fact that I had testified in front of President Carter's Commission on Mental Health about the status of Vietnam vets in 77. I got all this national attention, and so uh, Max became the VA secretary. Peanut Farmer becomes president, who had a son that was in the Navy during the period, and they bring me in to basically clone the program I had in L.A., which so became public... Yeah, so and, and PTSD hadn't even become a fact yet. I was still in the battle in 77, 78. And, and when did the, the wording, the post-traumatic stress disorder... Finally, psychiatry had to bend and define tra delayed traumatic stress and called it post-traumatic stress. It was just language, right. and it became uh, in the DSM-3 in 1980. That's when it really became a diagnosis, but I'm in battle... With that, 78, trying to sit in, in lobby with World War II vets who thought baby, Vietnam vets were crybabies and everything for the VA and for Cranston, Senator Cranston and, uh, and Max, and I lobbied uh, a lot of funny right, stories because right. I'd have to dress up in a coat and tie with all this bush, and they would look in there, and I'd be talking to... Uh, uh, Senator uh, Teague from Texas, Medal of Honor. He sat in his office in a suit. He's about 5'5". Five, five. He looked like a, a bear. And we went at it. And, but he respected me because when, after he died, I, I was a runner-up for the G Olin Teague Award oh for Outstanding <laughs> Services in America because his award's given every year. And his wife came up and said, hey, he just really loved you, but you you stood toe to not many people stay toe to toe to the tiger. So when you actually had the men with you and the women, is that when you did your the rap sessions and the the rap band? sessions were instant because oh, okay. that's where they were and there were when you got three hundred and thirty plus thousand veterans, majority men then, uh, you know, and I'm one person. I was I was doing them all over the city, like I said, sit six days a week. Uh, running groups in basements and churches and synagogues. And your phone bank, because I love that idea of the phone Well, bank. that came later, because once we, once I went in in Public Law 9622, the Vet Center program, right. which I designed or whatever and co-authored with Reverend Bill Mahidi, God rest his soul, chaplain, Catholic chaplain in, in, in the Navy. Uh, you know, I, I uh, had the task, the hardest years of my life, really, of dealing with the VA bureaucracy and Congress to set up the first hundred vet centers in the first hundred cities in the United States. Mm -hmm. I had no idea, you know, and I knew how they should be, but I had to fight directors of VAs that didn't like it. They, this program was jammed down their throat by Congress. It wasn't funded by the VA, but they decided the VA, as you saw in the 60-minute right, right. piece, had to have someone to fiduciate the money 
to all the centers and to all the people that we hired. How did you, I mean, I'm listening to all, Woo! as everybody knows what you did, how did you ever have time to write three books? I mean, one was Captains for a Dark Morning. Wow. I how did, did you come up with that? When I first went to Washington, uh, on Max, when Max became VA secretary, and Cranston was finally, since 1972, pushing this public law for treatment of Vietnam vets that he knew, and he's right. a World War II vet and a Democrat. So uh, they bring me in, and right away, uh, it's like, this is how it should be done. My success is being boots on the ground, in the field, not in the VA hospitals, where veterans can go and start and talk. We don't call it uh, a counseling centers, even though it's in the, right. in the legal law. It's vet centers. Right. And we do rap groups. Good. It's group therapy. So I got the coin rap because that's what we did. And that's what you did in the war. Let's rap. What's up? You know, put your weapons down. And so that's how it evolved. I mean, I've been in this 50 years, so stuff evolved. So the rap groups have stayed. The vet centers have expanded to over 300. Mm. But the bureaucracy and battling that every year in Congress thinking, well, the VA says it's not necessary, and we've told the Vietnam vets you finally have a program. Every year they were trying to shut it down. Every year. Wow. And it was a fight, and I just wanted to get back to the streets. And that's when several local successful Vietnam vet businessmen said, Shad, let's start a nonprofit. What's a nonprofit? <laughs> you, know, I, you know, is it like a church, or what do you talk? No. And so I designed it not to emulate the VA or the vet centers, right. but a way to get immediate contact with a veteran when you get out or if you've never been to a VA or whatever, to talk to, to help sort out where you need to go for help, whether it's for benefits, whether it's for counseling, whether it's for medical, whether it's for education. Talk to a vet, someone that's been there that listens. And that was the whole premise of the National Veterans Foundation. Right. And in 1985, we eventually got the nonprofit status or whatever, and I had five veteran businessmen that knew nothing about it, but they loved me. Right. And they, you know, they felt bad because they had lost a lot of their own that had come back because we had a high incident of suicide mm. by 1980, 81, 82. How many actually today, every day, is the statistic? It's probably up to 28 to 30 now because of what we talked about. Uh, Dove and I earlier when we met about the isolation that came with the COVID still going on may right. kick up again and how that accelerated the isolation that I, many of these struggling right. have. I must tell everyone, your program is not a 24-7. No. And when I heard that, I said, wait a minute now. How can we get this program to be 24-7? Because that's what it needs to be. It has to be. And... We have so many people out there, Shad, that I know after they listen to what you've been through and about the National Veterans Foundation, that I know that they would want to help and donate. Uh, I was privileged to do a PSA, public service announcement, for your it's group. It's on our website. And what it was was taking people, and here I'm going to say it, older people, yeah, I never say it, but it's true, older people, that when we no longer are here, in our wills, we give to uh, dogs and we give to cats and we give to, uh, you know, what, you know, surfers or whatever. Why not give to the National Veterans Foundation? First, I want to thank you for your service. And I hope you've been shown the respect, the support, and the peace of mind that you've earned by serving our country. There are some veterans of all ages who are not so fortunate. They're not getting by. They've gone downhill from concern to depression to wanting to end it all. The National Veterans Foundation has 30 years experience in helping vets with every kind of problem. Their hotline only uses other veterans who are trained to help. They handle 10,000 calls a year, and that's only from nine to five, Monday through Friday. We need to go 24 seven. We need to provide all the information that can help avoid such depression. I just added a gift to them in my will, and I hope and believe it will help. 
I hope you will always enjoy the peace and freedom you deserve for the rest of your life. I also hope that you will join me in leaving something for those veterans who have had a tougher time. Thanks again for your service. Thank you so much for keeping my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren safe. For that, you're always in my thoughts. And now, in my will. Thank you. How do they do that? How can we... We, ha we have a legacy thing on our website, and we'll leave the website hopefully when we finish yeah. on there where they can go and, and, and donate into the legacy thing for the continuation. Right now, uh, we have got six to nine covered, so we're now, well, not 24-7, but six to nine to get the East Coast because yeah. they're three hours ahead, and then about 12 hours during the weekends. It's about money. Right. We need about to raise an additional four fifty dollars to $500,000 a year, which is really not a lot of money, oh, right. to be up 24-7, yeah. which we can do. You know, now with the social media, with the phone systems and stuff, uh, and where can they go? www what? nvf.org. Just nvf. You don't even have to do www. Okay. Uh, we'll have it in the lower nvf.org the and yeah. go there. We'll be right back. At one time or another, every family is faced with mobility issues for a loved one. Call Before You Fall is here for you with all the safety and mobility solutions your family needs. Come see Alex in the Call Before You Fall showroom, or if you can't, they'll come to you in one of their fully stocked service vans. So put your mind at ease today. Call Alex at 1-800-829-1491. Remember, be on the safe side. Chad, where will we ever, ever find another madman <laughs> to continue what you do. I, I don't know whether there's anybody out there that could do what you do. I just don't know. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't get married till I was 70, okay? So I'll just be honest. I was married to my work. And as you can see, I'm a little passionate about a little? The, a little. Bad, <laughs> the bad deal that veterans have gotten. Yes, yes. And, 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 and I'll just, that's mildly put. And... For some reason, it still jacks me up and makes me try to figure out how we can change that. And it's been a journey, and I know, uh, I just hope that there's somebody, they don't have to be the madman or whatever. Right. It could be a guru, it could be a Gandhi type, just to continue, get at least the line open 24-7, so before things get bad, that you can talk, and we do it every day. We have people put the gun down from their head every week just to listen to a vet because no one else is going to talk them out of that. And you just listen and you tell, I feel your pain. And when you've been there and you've tasted death and you've been near death, like most of my men and women, they know it. And, and the women issue became really huge in these last two wars yes. because now women serve. And what we found out, which was my big concern, was military sexual trauma came up out of the ground yeah. like a volcano. For first five years, from Iraq and Afghanistan, 26,000 sexual assaults a year in the armed services. 26,000. Mm -hmm. And not addressed. And there's still, Congress is still saying, we've got to do better yeah. or whatever. And the women will not go to the VA because it's all men there. And they are traumatized yeah. from men. In most, and we have men that have been traumatized by men in sexual assaults. Don't get me wrong, but right. the majority are these women, and that's why we set up an MST division. What in is there. MST? Military sexual trauma okay. Okay. Uh, for, for women vets to call in and try to get them to help wherever they are in the country. But it's an epidemic, too, just like climate change, uh, 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 COVID, Delta, I mean, everything yeah, is going yeah. up. You know, <laughs> we could be here, <clears throat> pardon me, we could be here for, for days, as you know, and not get to everything that we have to get. The main thing is what we need, and Chaplain Dove has been in the service in the Air Force. God bless him. God bless him. And 
I know you've seen it in, in the men and everything and the women. Uh, we're asking everyone, we don't tell anybody anything, but we ask you, if this is not in your minds after hearing Shad today, one of the most important things that you must do to help 24-7 to get them to where you have to be. That's our goal. So if everyone out there will do something, God willing, it will get to where you need it to get to. So, and, and the other thing I'd like to add is keep in mind that those of us who have served, when we take off that uniform, we never stop serving. And I've had the privilege of knowing Shad. We were in the service at the same time during the Vietnam War. He got to be where they were shooting at him. I got to go to Europe where nobody shot at me. But I know and I've met enough people and counseled people who have come back, whose friends, whose, whose uh, fellow soldiers have been killed or maimed. Do something that you'll be proud of Hi. and your grandkids will be proud of support the National Veterans Foundation org. NBF Shad. org. You'll be glad you did. Right. And so will your families. Shad, my darling. Really and truly. You too we, are well, we, well, marvelous. We, we can say thank you. You are from the real <laughs> soldiers on the streets. You really are. Well, no, you really are. That's it, what it, we it, do. It, no, I know. Yeah. I'm just acknowledging it. Yeah. I want everybody to know I, I'm not alone in this. <laughs> well, it's, it's something that comes, as I said, uh, to Chaplain Dove before we went on with you today. It comes from the heart. And when it comes from the heart, then it's visual to everybody. And yours is right there how you feel about your fellow uh, military men and women. I cannot thank you enough. Chaplain Dove cannot thank you enough. The world cannot thank you enough. Everyone, remember what I always say. A life well lived, being well lived, to help the world one day at a time, one week at a time, one moment at a time. And that's what Shad Mishad, National Veterans Foundation does for your brothers, your sisters, your mothers and dads. Please help them help Shad. May God bless all of you and we'll see you next time.